fight. All right, so personal branding and marketing. Um, I think a lot of people use the term synonymously, um, and I'm not going to get in the weeds because I listened to way too many podcasts and looked at too many videos and read too many articles where people have differing differing opinions of what branding versus marketing mean. Uh, but my definition or my sense of the two terms are two different things that come together. They create an intersection that create um, a, a signature for yourself, if you will, like I said, to influence people to, to do business with you. So that's what we're going to talk about today. A little bit about me. My name's Edric. I'm with Bold Realty. We're uh, brokered by EXP. And um, I've been in real estate. Um, this year is year 17, I believe. Um, so been around for a while. I've made all the mistakes when it comes to everything. So um, what I like to do now when it comes to masterminding and coaching is I try to implement some of the, the home runs so that you guys can maybe save some time, save a lot of money, um, and start to implement some things in your business to be able to scale your business to the next level. Um, we are recording this session because this will become some training content that we'll use in the future. So once I have that available, we'll have it in a library, and I usually host it on YouTube so you'll have access to it um, in the future. So let's jump to the next slide here and move you guys over here. So like I was talking about earlier, branding and marketing, two different, imagine two different worlds. Um, and on one side, you have brand. Um, brand is the feeling that you get when you see something, when you see a product or when you see a company, um, it's, it's their ability to be able to give you a certain feeling. Marketing is their method of delivery of that feeling. So there are certain things that they do um, to be able to get, get that um, out to you. The way that those things intersect create the value proposition, the reason why you use that company versus another or that person versus another, and it gets the message across. This brand is the best in the business because X, Y, Z. For example, let's talk about Gucci, which is a designer company. That's part of their brand. Their message is we're designer. We create a valuable product because of the quality of the product. So that's one word that comes to my mind. There's quality there. Um, part of their brand, in my opinion, is the fact that they are expensive. The reality is you could probably get just as good of quality of a product from another um, brand, um, but you're buying um, that almost that that limit that limited product because of the fact that they they have this claim of having this luxury product and being one of the only ones. So. Um, they're, that's what their message is. How they deliver that message um, is through their um, the way that they market. Number one, for example, you're not going to find Gucci in Walmart. Can somebody tell me why? You're going to have to go to Saks. You're going to have to go to somewhere night or even a, a Gucci department store. Why wouldn't you find Gucci in Walmart? <laughs> The exclusivity makes it desirable. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want an experience when I go. Has it have, has anyone on the call ever been in like a Gucci department store? I'm, I'm not a department store, but an actual the, a Gucci freestanding store or a designer store for that matter. What's the experience that you get when you go in that store? Sleeping made my social anxiety is 10 times worse. I used to be stressed about going to school and talking to new kids and stuff, but around my friends. I'm going to mute you, Angela. Um, but anyone, feel free to unmute. If you've ever been into a designer store, or let's let's say designer anything, whether that's a designer store, if you've been in a luxury car dealership versus a uh, general, you know, Chevrolet or a Ford dealership, what was your experience? Well, you get your own sales rep okay. for starters. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you get a personal concierge, right? You yeah. get a personal shopper. That's I think that's what they call them, a, a personal shopper. Yes. Did you are, are we talking about a depart uh, Gucci right now or like a designer store? Yeah, just like any designer store. Yeah. What's the other thing you'll notice when you go in there? Um I, I'll I'll just go ahead and say it. 
there, uh, one thing that I noticed is that they don't have racks stacked up with a bunch of stuff. It's yeah. almost like a museum. Every piece is specifically put in that store to inspire um, some sort of emotion from you. And so it's almost like they're limited. They only have this many purses. They only have this one dress. Um, and I don't feel like when you go into an environment like that, the, the, the purpose is really for you to go in there to buy anything. I don't think that their goal is to market to you in that store. I think their goal is to brand their products. So when you go home, especially nowadays, what do you do? You get online and then you start shopping for something that's really not limited. Um, it's something that anyone can get get their hands on, um, but you you get that that feeling, um, that luxury and that personalized feeling. Um, so the the value proposition in that in that example is you're one of very few who get the opportunity to take advantage of this. Um, and the message is that you get your personal concierge, and I'll go one step further. They're uniformed. They try to mute who they are and make you the star of the show. Um, and that's something that we can all implement in our business. How do you create an atmosphere where your target audience becomes the star of the show and you are the one that's facilitating it in your own store, if you will? So <laughs> Jessica says they roll out the red carpet. They sure do. They sure do. Funny story. So <laughs> my wife um, took me to Gucci because I'm, I'm not a designer guy or I used to not be. But because uh, I'm like, it's, this is just way overpriced. So she's like, well, let's just go and experience because she loves fashion. She loves those things. And um, so I said, well, let's go do it. And of course, I got hooked and we got our personal shopper. And she was I was first. My first impression was that she's going to be snooty because we're in a Gucci store. She was so down to earth. She was so authentically interested in who we were as people where we were from, you know, what brought us to the store, um, trying to just kind of build a, 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 a diet, you know, more than just building a dialogue, but building a story out of who we were as people. But here's what really made it impressive. And this is what I took back home with me. It was maybe two months later. And this store was in Miami, by the way. Two months later, we decided we're going to go to Miami for the weekend because, you know, we don't have anything to do. It'll be cool. We'll be able to go hang out at the beach. And the weather was crappy here in um in North Carolina so we went down there and I looked at my wife because now that she's got me hooked on this new drug called Gucci right I said well we don't have anything to do today let's 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 take the car and, and drive to Gucci and see if they have anything new in there and um you know as we were thinking about it she gets a text message from our personal shopper saying hey how's life going how's everything going um i was thinking about you guys and we have some new stuff in the store if you're ever in the area let me know i'd love to uh show you guys around so i don't know maybe she put a tracker on us but the fact that she that message came when it did was so powerful because we could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation essentially with gucci and say well, yeah, we're in town. We're going to come. And hey, can we even can we skip the line? We don't want to wait in the line to get in the store. She said, yeah, just let me know when you get here and I'll, I'll let you in. You know, so now you get that VIP experience. But I just thought that that was super cool because at the end of the day, we just wanted to go look. Now, when we left, my credit card said otherwise, but that experience created um, that feeling of it's OK to shop here. And not only that, it's more than just going to shop anywhere else, even if it's down to a, a Saks Fifth Avenue where they have Gucci products, you, you get better service in this atmosphere. So anyways, um, I digress. Sorry for telling you my bougie Gucci story. I'm trying to wean myself off of it now. Um, so you guys can see all these adjectives, right, in these in, in the things that describe each area. So let's, I'm going to start on the right, or I'm sorry, on the left, branding. That's the name. That's the voice that you want to project. That's your logo. That's your tagline. What do you want people to think about when they see your logo and, and your, your name? Um, what do you want them to expect? Um, in this example we use with Gucci, you want, they want people to expect luxury, best, best product in, in his class, right? Fonts, that can play a role. How do you want people to feel when they see your words? Do you want them to be inspired? Do you want them to, um, do you want to 
uh, convey humor, fun, seriousness. These are the things that you impl that colors and, and fonts implement. Um, promises. You know, if you use us, this is going to happen no matter what, right? Visual style. Uh, are you projecting a certain lifestyle uh, by doing business uh, with one brand versus another? Um, personality. That's big for me. I, I would I like to be the person that people want to do business with or want to associate with just based off of personality. I want to be I want to be the people's friend, so to speak, where I can relate to anyone. Reputation. Um, this is a big one. Um, it's but it's super important. Um, a reputation in, in real estate specifically goes a long way. The one thing that I really try hard to do is I try to be nice to people. Um, there's a tagline that um, a friend of mine <clears throat> years ago at Remax, his tagline was work hard, be nice. And I love that because it's like working hard is almost when you're working hard, you, you almost have to be serious, but you don't have to be an asshole. And so I like to work hard, but be nice while you're doing it. Make people feel good while you're working hard. Um, and that creates this reputation of not only am I going to get the best service from this particular company, but I'm going to have fun while I'm working with. Work. So on the right, when you got marketing, you have campaigns. How are we going to push out this branding? How are we going to push out our expectations? How are we going to push out our logo and the promises that we deliver on? What's our inbound, outbound experience? When people call us, how are we going to answer the phone? When we call people, how are we going to inspire them to remember us? Whatever, where are, what are our advertising, um, um, what are our advertising volumes, if you will? How, how do we, how do we get our message across? What offers do we have? And, and, and don't get it wrong. It's not, you know, buy one, get one free kind of offers, but an offer could be, this is not only am I going to be your real estate agent, but I'm going to be your wealth advisor. And we're going to use the vehicle of real estate to do that and creating the brand and the marketing through that. What channels do you want to use? Everybody, we all know you got to use social media now, but does that mean print is dead? Does that mean radio is dead? Does that mean, uh, Commercials on cable television are dead? I don't know. Actually, I do know. And I'll argue that print ad is not dead. But there's a way that you have to um, use that now versus how we used to use it, use it 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, promotions, media, sales calls, our SEO, uh, SEO, search engine optimization. So when someone goes on Google and searches, uses keywords, am I going to come at the top of the list? And have I, have I done the work to come to the top of the list? And my leads, what do I do with the leads? You know, real estate agents, y'all, y'all the worst. Because what do y'all want? More leads, more leads. Well, how many houses have you sold to a lead? I can answer that for you. Zero. You don't sell houses to leads. You sell houses to clients. So the question is, once you figure out how to get the leads, what's your process through your branding and marketing to convert them to client? And then once you create a client and you sell them a house, what's your process to get that brand loyalty? So they come to you over and over and over again, where you become not just a, an option, but the only option. And that's where you start to go deeper in your process. Any questions, comments before I move on? All right. So on this next page here, this is a brand strategy and it's a, it's a lot of stuff. So don't get overwhelmed by it. But I wanted to show you guys. It's just something I found. Um, it's a Google image, but it's something I found when you guys are starting to think about as you start to brand your business, what things to implement. And a lot of us on the call already have a brand, so to speak. But this can still benefit you because there's different places where you may have some holes or some gaps where you can create some improvement. So you'll see, for example, your brand story. Why is your brand your brand? Why did you choose the colors? Why did you choose the font? What what uh, what um, emotion do you want to um, do you want to inspire? And you'll see under it has your before state and your after state. So 
trying to track before you implemented something in the after and following that this is a long term thing. And what are some things I can implement to to continue to grow it? And how are you positioned when it comes to the competition? Who's your audience? Now, this one's really big, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself here, but your audience is really big. And, and the reason I say that is because if you don't know who you're selling to, then you're trying to sell to everybody. And again, this is a big problem for us in real estate because the first thing, especially when you're a new agent, when, when I ask you the question, who's your audience? A lot of you say any and everybody who will buy a house. And right now, it used to be well, anybody who can qualify for a home loan, right? But that don't even work anymore because anybody who can qualify for a home loan can't buy a house in this market. So if it's that broad, then your branding is going to get so watered down. It's going to get so diluted that you really won't be able to create any stickiness with it. What I want you guys to do, we're going to do an exercise right now, and I want you guys to just mentally think about this. I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes because that's weird, but imagine yourself closing your eyes and think about you're out um, selling a house to someone. And I want you to visualize what that person looks like, what they do for a living, what their familial status is. Narrow it now even to like what they're wearing and where they're from. And then just create this like this imaginary story of how you met them and, you know, what made you resonate because you're really enjoying working with. Them. So this is this is the type of client I want you to imagine. Don't the asshole that you're glad that closed. Sorry, I, I swear a little bit. I'm a little sailor, but. You don't, that's not the person I want you to visualize. Visualize that person that, God, you, you show them houses for free because they're just so much fun to be around. And then once you visualize that, put a name to that person, right? That's your audience in its simplest form at the lowest level, right? Now, I want you to, as you start to develop your brand and you start to market your brand, I want you to do it for that one person you just created. Just that one person. And here's the reason why. Once you narrow down your branding and marketing that specific, you're going to create a followership of people that are just like that person. And the reason why you resonate with that person a lot is because you're a lot like them, right? They're the person that would be your friend, right? So you're the most authentic in that space. And when you start to market towards that space, it starts to bring people to you naturally. So Think about that. Start to build your your any branding or any type of marketing you do based off of that one person. Don't think about, well, if I do this ad, how many people will click on it? Here's the reality, guys. I know there are certain people that aren't going to ever do business with me. And that's OK, because I don't want to do business with them. They're, we don't click. So why am I spending marketing dollars trying to get them to buy a house from me? What sense does that make? Um, down here, let's see. I want to jump to the bottom middle uh, widget here where it has brand identity. And I'm going to show you guys mine where, where I developed our brand um, a few years ago. But you'll see they narrowed it down to the topography, the color scheme. Um, you have color codes, that's, that's how deep you can get with branding. And the more consistent you stay with that, the, be, the easier it is to convey your message. So what is your personal brand and why do you need it? It's a great question. Personal branding, it doesn't clarify the why. Why should you hire me? It's how you connect. It's how you connect with people, not prospects, not leads, not even clients, but it's how you connect with people. And it inspires a sense of loyalty. So when you give something with, with nothing in return, then you create brand loyalty. You create personal loyalty where people want to do business with you because they want to connect with you and stay connected with you. And they want to tell everybody that they care about about you because they want everybody they care about to get the same feeling that they got. So I told you guys I'm, I was going to go deep. We're going deep, right? Are you doing that? Or are you just putting out pretty pictures with pretty colors 
and saying, I sold another house. Are you, are you being vulnerable? Now, we all got different levels that we can, a vulnerability that we're willing to put out there, but I would encourage you to start to shave some vulnerability in when it comes to branding and, and marketing yourself, because that's what really resonates with people, right? Um, a carefully managed personal brand establishes your credibility. It ensures business longevity. It gets those people that, you know, that husband and wife that just got married and had their first kid to buy that first house from you, but then sell it with you a few years later because they have to upgrade to a bigger house because they have more kids and to work with um, their cousins because you guys are friends now and to help them buy a second vacation home because he's been promoted over and over again and now they have the income to do that. It, it's the, you know, you get the birthday invitations and that sort of thing because you're so embedded with these people and you understand them so much and they understand you so much that business is just kind of a, it's a byproduct of the relationship. Now, of course, at a certain point, we all want to scale our business to get so big that we can actually support um, other people. We can create team concepts, but there's a way, um, and that's kind of, you know, the journey that I'm on right now. And those, some of us on this call that are on the team, we're trying to figure out how do we create a brand that that's significant, but it goes um, across the board where we can all take advantage um, of it and be able to add our culture to it together as one, right? And, and inspire that brand loyalty. Questions, comments? Yes, I have a question. Sure. Um, when you spoke about vulnerability with the, the personal branding, mm -hmm. like you said, are you just posting a house and saying, hey, I just sold this house to another client. Can you expand upon how you recommend integrating vulnerability into that type of post? Yeah, so great question. So the first thing I would say is I would be leery about how much real estate houses that I post. Um, those of you, if you follow me on social media, I just started this video campaign. Sometimes I talk about real estate. Sometimes I talk about you know, somebody in my family. Sometimes I talk about, you know, the, the, the most exciting vacation I've ever taken. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to weave, I'm trying to create a character via social media so that people can understand. And when I, when I get to the point of vulnerability, it's kind of like, you know, the worst transaction I've ever had. That's how I can weave in real estate or the, one of the videos, I don't, I don't even think I posted it yet, but it was talking about my favorite client. And it, and it, that client was, uh, Mr. Bill, Mr. Bill was 80, I believe it was 83 or 84 when I sold him a house. And his story just resonated with me because it was a, it was a bucket list item. Before he died, he wanted to be a homeowner. He was dead set on doing it. And it made me feel so overwhelmed that he chose me to be the one to help him do that. Right. So there's the vulnerability. That's what inspires some emotion. Um, but vulnerability doesn't have to be, oh, you, I, I just love you, Edward, because you always make me sad, because nobody wants to be some, around somebody who's depressed all the time, right, or sad. But I want to inspire you to, to think bigger. I want to inspire you to laugh. I want to inspire you to do so many other things. So that's what I mean by vulnerability. Um, if I'm going to put, if I'm going to market a house, um, th let's think outside of the box, right? Is it just a three bedroom, two bath house on the north side of town that has a big fenced in backyard. It's more than that. Vulnerability is even, let's think about it from this perspective. Create vulnerability out of your audience, out of that guy you just imagined, right? Or that gal that you just imagined who's, who's your ideal client. What would make it vulnerable for them? So as you're writing the description of the post or the marketing description, talk to them, not, not a thousand people but that one person so here um an example right off the cuff right the three bedroom two bath house and with the fenced in yard right so i would say something along the lines of this is the dream you know this is the dream that's come true for you um you can have uh the home to start to grow your family in 
and be able to teach your son how to play baseball like your dad did when you were younger. Um, and you can bring Fido because the yard's already fenced in. Um, but if you don't like Fido, it's okay because there's room for a pool and the owners already got it, got a permit to do so, you know, something like that, right? So I'm trying to, I'm trying to specify it to that person. And there's something, all that stuff is going to apply to that ideal client. But some of that stuff is going to uh, apply to many different people that are, that are my ideal clients. Um, Kim, I hope I answer your questions. Like, how do you, how do you convey vulnerability? I'd say take out the product and give more of yourself is, is the answer to that question. Does that help a little bit? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's really hard because we're in an atmosphere where we look online and we look at social media and all these real estate agents act like they got all their shit together and you don't get to see behind the curtain. I would argue, show them what's on stage, be the celebrity. I'm not discouraging that at all, but show them what's behind the curtain, right? Show them what, what they truly are going to get, good and bad, if they decide to work with you. I don't know if any of you guys like uh, Doja Cat, but she's, I, I haven't always been a fan, but I, you know, I became a fan because of her TikTok page, because what you see the polished Doja Cat that we see is not really who she is. She is the geekiest, uh, biggest clown that I've ever seen. And it like, it's night and day. Matter of fact, uh, she reminds me of like the artist, I think her name's Sia, that used to wear this wig that covered her whole face. Um, so she had this beautiful, and for those of you who don't know who I'm talking about, she's the one that wrote and she wrote a lot of songs, but she wrote and performed the song Chandelier. I'm gonna swing from the chandelier. Anyway, so if you don't know it, Google it, but great song, right? She was interviewed about why does she always disguise herself? Why didn't she show her face? And she talked about when she first got into, um, when she first became a celebrity or she first started writing songs for other celebrities, it was great, she loved that. And then when she started performing herself, that lifestyle change really made her spiral. It made her, she became a drug addict, she became an alcoholic, all these things. So when she really started blowing up, she said, I, I want to have a personal life and I don't want to be in the spotlight. I want my art to speak for me, which is, is performance. So now, you know, of course, now she's come out and we know what her face looks like, but modern day, you got Doja Cat where when she's on stage or she's performing, she's all made up and you know, Hollywood, or I'm sorry, the, the music industry wants, you know, wants you to be sexy and that's all that you need to sing about or whatever. But again, she's a, a practical joker in real life when you follow her on social media. Um, so I say show both sides because it creates more fanship out of that. Anybody else got a comment or question on that? That's a, that's a great question. Again, it's a mastermind, folks. Jump in. If you disagree with me, that's okay to say so. Good. Yeah, I love when everybody agrees with me. <laughs> One awesome. second, man. So, you know, it does make you more relatable, though, as well, too. Because if you're only the, the real estate salesperson the entire time and you just have that, that mask on, people are not going to be able to relate with you as if they were if you were posting a picture of you hiking in the woods or going on a cool vacation somewhere or riding a bicycle or whatever. It doesn't matter. Or going hanging out with your kids, making a dinner. That's just more relatable, and then they'll feel more comfortable if they're going to meet you for the first time. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you. It's almost like you're you're speed dating, and you get to create that relationship before you even meet someone. And that's why I used the term earlier, becoming that celebrity. Right. The best thing to, to know that your branding is working is when you meet strangers and they say, "I see you all the time. I just love the content that you put out there. I just love how you make." real estate so simple or whatever it is that's your thing um it's almost like they already know you because they see you and you are interesting enough for them to continue to follow you you don't want to wait to become important to someone when they're ready to make a home buying selling decision it could take years um but that's that's awesome branding that's awesome branding that's awesome marketing when you're able to do that 
So great point, uh, Willis. Thanks for, for sharing that. So let's talk about personal branding, um, the questions you should ask yourself. And here's the thing, folks. I'm a believer that personal branding and business branding should intersect the same way branding and marketing do. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll get in details on that. So here's some questions to ask. What are your core principles and values? What's important for you? Not what's, what do you think is important to the market or what are other agents doing, but what's important for you? Um, in a nutshell, for myself and my team is I want, like I said before, I want us to work hard, be nice, but here's the thing. I want us to make a great living selling real estate, doing what we enjoy doing, but also able to enjoy life, to have a well-balanced life. Um, it's easy. You can be successful in real estate and have a miserable life. I've seen many people do it, but can you, can you balance that out? Can, and not have to shut on, shut off. You can do it all the time. What's your mission statement? Why are you doing what you're doing? What, what's important? What, what drives things home for you? What inspired you to start in the business in the first place? And hey, guess what? It's okay to say, because I wanted to make a lot of money. I love that. That's a question you ask new agents. What, well, what makes you want to get in real estate? Or why did you decide to get into real estate? You know what the number one answer is? I just love looking at houses and I just love showing houses. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> well, would you do it for free? Because <laughs> I wouldn't. I love the freedom that real estate provides us. I love that every day is not like the day before and it won't be like tomorrow. I love the, the opportunities is provided for me and, and those that I love and those that I care about. Those are the things that I love about real estate. And that's why I decided you know, to get into real estate. And I love the fact that I can actually invest in real estate. I understand it a lot better now than I used to. But to me, it's the best way to create wealth. And it's the, it's, it's, it's the best hedge against inflation. Um, it's the best, it's, it's the least risk aversive. If I buy a stock and that stock goes down because a product changes, then that's what it is. But guess what? People got to live somewhere. And they're not going to change how they live or where they live overnight. People aren't going to say, well, we don't need to live in houses anymore. Let's go all live in the woods. Right. They may change their their um, the type of real estate they're attracted to. Just like let's use the example of, you know, generations before the two bedroom, one bath house was really popular in the Vietnam era. Right. You know, um, or yeah. So that was cool. But as families grew and families got bigger, and I'll go as recent as a few years back, we had these builders building these big box homes, these 3,000 plus square foot homes, right? Because that's what the buyer demanded, right? And they did it at a, at a reasonable price. Now, here's the thing. You didn't get a lot of custom appeal to it. Sometimes you had to pay extra for the window trim, but that was okay because that's what the market called for. So just think about, you know, um, keeping in mind, who is it that you're trying to go for as you, and I got way off subject there, but my mission, that's how my mission statement um, reads. It's, it's kind of like, I want to help other people love real estate as much as I do. That's, that's the simplest way to put it, right? And the byproduct, of course, is I'm going to make a lot of money and that's okay. But now it's not, I want to make a lot of money first and whatever it takes and how many other, how many ever clients I got to step on their throat to make that money, that ain't going to work. But definitely I want to, I want to inspire people to love real estate as much as I do. Y'all can steal that, right? And the byproduct is I'll make a great living. Give enough people what they want and you'll get everything you want. Help other people achieve the goals that they want and you'll get everything that you want in life. So why do you want to offer your products or services to the target audience? Let's say the target person. Why is it? Why do you want to offer them this product and service? Why do they want it from you? If you don't know the answer to that, that's something to really, you know, chew on. Chew on that for a minute. Let that, let that sizzle in your spirit. Why would I deal with you versus the next guy or the next gal? Which leads to the next question. What makes you unique? And let me tell you something, your hairstyle ain't enough. The car you drive ain't enough. Where you from ain't enough. 
Now, a combination of all these things could be enough, but are you actually communicating that and are you actually relaying that to the market, to the marketplace? What makes your internal company culture? Our company, you know, we're, we're very team, our culture is very team oriented. We're all about, okay, how can we learn from one another? Um, we love to have fun. We love to hit goals, you know, goal sets. And we love to, you know, see something that, you know, create something that started as nothing become something that's, that's bigger than we are. I would say that that's what our company culture is. Somebody else that's on the, on the team may say something different. They may say it's a cutthroat business and you don't want to be a part of it. But anyway, um, what's your professional sense of style? I love this one. I'm going to I'm going to call on you guys now or I'm going to ask you guys, uh, should there be a difference between your professional sense of style versus your unprofessional sense of style? First of all, never be unprofessional, <laughs> but should there be a difference? I would say no, really. Okay. And why would you say that? I get how you look every day, you know, without, even if they see you at Walmart, is there going to yeah. be a really drastic difference between yeah. showing houses and how you go to Walmart? Exactly. Yeah, listen, um, <laughs> your professional style is, is does not end with when you have all the hair in the right place and your makeup's on fleek and you got that outfit, you know, you got it going on, right? It's beyond that. I'm wearing a t-shirt right now. I may put on a baseball cap later. That's my professional sense of style just as much as if I wear a three-piece suit because that's me in three dimension, right? Now, here's one thing. You ain't going to catch me going outside like our, a lot of our kids on this call might do where they won't even wash their face and brush their teeth because I'm from that generation where, you know, what mama say, don't leave the house without washing your tail because you don't want to get in an accident with dirty underwear on, right? I, that's me. Now, these, I don't know what these Gen Xers and Gen Ys are doing because they'll, they'll leave the house in their pajamas and, and whatever else. But the, the professional sense of style is I carry myself the same way, whether I am in a professional setting or if I'm having a good time with friends. Um, and I think people want to see more of that. So to your point, Vanessa, I absolutely agree. I, yes, I want you to post yourself in your best light. I want you to put out there yourself in your best light and make video of you where everything's perfect. But I also want to see that video of you coming out of the gym and telling me, you know, your hair's so messed up, you got a baseball cap on and you ain't got no makeup on, but you're telling me about how, you know, you, you had a goal to, to run two miles without stopping on a treadmill. And it took you two weeks to get there, but you finally hit it and you're doing this on video, right? Because now there's a connection, right? There's a connection there. But if I all I see is you like always just, it just looks like you're always killing it. What's gonna happen is I'm gonna become a little bit intimidated. I'm gonna feel like, wow, this person is way too good for me, you know? Let me go use Willis because Willis wear baseball caps because he have hair, bad hair days and he makes those funny TikTok videos and I feel like I can connect with him more. But I'd, I'd never be good enough for Vanessa because every time I look at her stuff, even though I love the information she's putting out, it seems like she's just got it too much together and I'm nervous I won't even qualify to buy a house. So I don't want to embarrass myself with Vanessa. Right. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. If you got if you guys don't want to talk, if you got something you want to add, feel free to hit that chat box. Let me know um, what you um, what you guys are thinking. All right. So doesn't that Edric, doesn't yeah. that go with who your um, target audience is? So I'm guessing mm -hmm. if you're looking for a more upscale audience, you probably have to adjust. That's my thought, you think or no? Yes, I do. But I think that things have changed substantially in the last few years because your upscale audience, your upscale home buyer, home seller are humans just like you are. They go to the gym like you do. And guess what? They shop at Walmart too. Now, I don't know. They might just shop at Target and that's okay, but they still have to, you know, they still take a poop just like you do <laughs> the way I heard it before. So the thing about it is if 
if that's if that's your target audience, but naturally you don't relate to that audience, then you're you're doomed from the get go. And the luxury audience, the luxury class, is not the silver spoon that it used to be. There's a lot of people who are starting to come into wealth based off of how our market, how our world has become global. And then let's talk about well, what what is the luxury market now. I was just thinking this morning. I'm glad you brought it up, Vanessa, because I was just thinking. What would it take to be a luxury agent in order to be considered a luxury agent? And then I thought, thought about, well, gosh, things have changed because every home buyer wants luxury now. So shouldn't the term be called lifestyle agent? I mean, it's something to think about. A, book, a few years back, uh, a $500,000 house in Fayetteville was, oh my God, you're rich. You got a lot of money. Today, it's like, okay, you got the budget where we can actually maybe find you a house. Right. So 300 is like the median where it used to be the top. You, it, it was so super exciting to get a client that could afford a three hundred thousand dollar house. And now you're like, I hope we can find you something and you're willing to make a competitive offer. So I don't think necessarily I think the people that are looking at, at luxury real estate are looking at lifestyle. And they're going to do a lot of the same things that you do if they resonate with you. If you try to put on this character, of this is who I am, to, and think that that's going to attract someone that's going to buy a million dollar house just because that's all you do, then I think you're going to, it's going to hurt you more than it's going to help you because you're, you're probably still not going to get that person, number two. And you're going to alienate yourself from the people that you really relate to because they don't get to see you in full dimension. Notice too the, a lot of people that are that luxury buyer per se, um, or the ones that have the money to buy that type house, they don't always present in that luxury way. Their jeans, t shirt, um, very down to earth, very just everyday average looking. So um, they're not so much broadcasting that I have money. So I guess, and you know, in looking for an agent, maybe they're not so much looking for an agent that's broadcasting. I got it all together. I'm perfect. They're looking for someone who is like them, you know, I guess. Um, everyday person that's doing, like you said, everyday things and they can connect to. Yeah, I, I agree. They're looking for, they, they're looking for a industry expert right so no matter how nice my outfit is if i'm not first of all if i'm only posting photos then i'm i'm i'm, I'm doomed right but if i'm conveying market knowledge where people can hear me and read what i have to say then what i'm doing is i'm inspiring whether it's luxury market whether it's first time buyer whether it's you know investor that i have a knowledge and they're going to want to reach out to me so uh, Glenda Baker, if you guys don't follow Glenda Baker, um, two ends from Atlanta. Um, she's an agent. She does a lot of video, but she was talking about how Jay-Z, when he first started out, when he had nothing, he wore all these gold chains and he wore all the designer clothes and he just oozed our perception of wealth. And now that he's a bazillionaire, he don't comb his hair. <laughs> You know, it's he's jeans, t-shirt, shirts, like you said, Kimberly, because he doesn't have to, when you have it, you don't have to like kind of put it in people's face. The people that really have it, they don't. And, they, and you, they're more opt to look for personality over, well, what do I want to work with this agent because she has on this outfit? Or do I want to work with this agent because he has a knowledge about the north side of town and, you know, um, the, the property values and, and what the city uh, plans on doing to develop the area or whatever, that, that's really what's gonna matter because people that have, that have uh, the means, um, are, those things are gonna be more important to them than what, is, what do you look like and, and what's your lifestyle. Now, don't get me wrong, you want to be able to convey that, you know that lifestyle and you understand that lifestyle, but there's a way to do it other than just the, the perception of, especially when all you put out there is a perception of a lifestyle that's not really your lifestyle. I say, bring it all in, right? Be a character in your own story. 
but definitely don't make that your only story. Anyways, good. This is good, guys. I'm loving this, this conversation. Um, your communication characteristics, you know, how do you how do you communicate? Are you a texter? Are you an emailer? Are you a video person? You know, nobody I already get it, folks. Nobody on this call likes doing video except for Willis, that is. <laughs> Everybody hates it because we hate what we sound like. We hate what we look like. Uh, we hate like everything about everything. And then so you don't do it. But I will caution you and, and I will preach this to the end of days, to the end of time. If you're not putting video content out there, you are missing the boat. You are going to go out of business. I, I can't put it any simpler. Here's how I know. 50% of people, and this is a national statistic, 50% of agents are doing 92% of the business nationally. Of those 50%, 20% are doing 85% of that 92% of business. When you drill it down, and I'm not going to go crazy with it, but when you drill it down, when you look at the, the, the top 10, 20%, they're doing video marketing. They're on social media. They're talking to the audience. They're not waiting for the audience to come to them. So if, if you're so fearful about how God made you that you don't want to put it out there, then I don't know, like, are you going to show houses with a paper bag on your head? Eventually, they're going to see what you look like. Eventually, they're going to see the words that you can't pronounce. Eventually, they're going to learn. This. So you might as well put it out now and you might as well make create that relationship now. This is the opportunity you have that Fortune 500 companies still haven't figured out because they can't personalize themselves. Coca-Cola can't personalize Coca-Cola. They can hire a celebrity and write them a big check so that the followers of that celebrity will say, well, if they drink Coca-Cola, then I should drink Coca-Cola. But they can't be Edric. All right. So put it out there, folks. And when it comes to content, and I'm sorry, this isn't like a video class, but that, that's for another day. But when it comes to content, talk about anything but and be consistent with it. Anyways, I'm going to move on here. What do you want to come to mind when someone hears your business name? When If you're going to go with logo or business name or even self name, um, that's where Bo was born from. I'm going to show you guys kind of what how my plans were when we created that brand. Um, and how do you want people to think of your business? How do you want customers to describe you as a company? I'll try to explain that to you. How are we doing on time? Oh, gosh, man, we got to move. We got to move quick. OK, so, guys, this is my brand board. So uh, those of you that know me, we were Remax years ago. I had a Remax franchise. I decided to discontinue that and I wanted to create my own brand. I wanted it. We were Remax Edge. Right. Because at the time I wanted to be the one of the, the, the best franchises, but I wanted to be on the edge of it. The Remax office I worked at seemed kind of stale. It was kind of like old school, which and it was a great office. I love I learned so much from the people I worked with. But I said, let's bring Remax and let's make it edgy. So after I left, I said, you know what? I want something. I don't want it to be edgy. It needs to be a name that's, you know, our brand needs to be bold. And then that's how the name Bo was born. So. What I did was I hired out a brand uh, company to help me create this bold brand. And so what you see here is kind of what after weeks of back and forth, they interviewed me. They asked me questions about you know, what I wanted to convey. And that's how we came up with our topography. You know, What kind of font do we want to use? What colors do we want to use? Um, you'll see on the right here. Um, you know, we went back and forth on what I liked, what I didn't like, and they, you know, they constantly changed it. Um, and then you'll see the pictures there and that describe, you know, that kind of influences when you look at those people, you look, you can see that they're dimensional, they have character and they're different. And we are um, all encompassing. We're all, you know, there's not a one look to what our bold brand is. Um, those photos that you see at the bottom kind of describe, you know, at the time, and can't, this was three and a half years ago. So at the time, I'm like, I want people that want to push the envelope, their uh, team environment, that want to work together and grow together. They're going to, you know, 
they're going to always push themselves physically, emotionally, psychologically, in every single way, and they're going to go the extra mile. And you see that slogan, when nothing goes right, go left, right? Don't feel like you have to go the right way to win. You don't have to go with the crowd to win. You can go in the opposite direction and still win. So that's where all of these things came together. And imagine it's just like a, like a design board, like if you're designing a house. And when you implement all those elements, make sure you incorporate it in all your, all your branding and all your marketing or as much as possible. So that's, you guys can create this on your own. I'm, I'm going to save you guys like, in, well, I, I encourage you, Maverick does a great job, but it, it was about $3,500 to get that much insight because I don't have enough creativity to do it. So they helped me with that and getting it right the first time. And I think it paid off because I still hear to this day people thinking bold is like this national thing and it's not. It's a brainchild of collaboration with me and a marketing company. So what's your personal marketing? Like I said before, I think it runs synonymously with your business marketing. Make one and two in the same. Bring the best of both worlds and make them both the same. Don't market houses. Houses will sell themselves. Bring a house into your marketing and, and build a story around it. Um, and then make yourself part of that story. Define your niche. This is a good one. Because again, going to pick on new agents again. Um, what, what type of real estate do you want to do? Well, I want to work with buyers and sellers and do commercial and sell land and sell and do rentals. And you're, you're, you're going to suck at a whole bunch of things is what I can tell you. What I can tell you is it's okay to, to have a, a ultimate goal. Um, and I think it's okay to start with one thing and constantly build and create more. But from my experience, when I try to do multiple things, um, I was not good at anything. And I was constantly you know, searching for that next thing. And when, you, when you're developing your niche, you need to develop your expertise. So you need to be really good at it. You need to become very knowledgeable about it because the more knowledgeable you become about it, the more confident you'll be at getting in front of a camera and talking to people about you know, foreclosures or interest rates and how inflation affects market values or you know, first time buyer products, if, if that's gonna be your niche, but you can focus on that and then grow from there. That's right, uh, Willis. Don't be a jack of all trades and master of none. Start, start small and grow from there. Limit your competition. Um, so if you're going in a market where, for example, if you want to be a buyer's representative, a buyer's agent, limit your competition by what type of buyer's agent you're going to be. What type of experience are you going to give to your buyer? Are you going to provide for your buyer? Um, produce, produce a demand for your services. Have people not just want to buy a house from you, but have people waiting in line. Figure that part out because essentially there's more agents than there are people that need to buy or sell a house. How do you, at any given time that is, so how do you differentiate yourself from the competition? Sharpen your message. Go from generic to very specified. Go from, hey, everybody, come buy a house from me to, hey, Brittany, buy a house from me. Here's why we're going to get along and, and make you believe it. Right. So that's that's how you define that. And again, folks, this isn't going to happen overnight because you guys are still starting to you're still exploring your business and you're still trying to develop who you want to be in the business. And again, that's what's so great about real estate. You can constantly um, reinvent yourself. So to decide your niche, go back, look uh, at your personal brand, ask yourself these questions. How does your personal life fit into your business? Right. I want to sell at a high level. I want to meet a lot of great people, but I also want to be able to run that, that two miles without stopping. And I want to do it in less than 18 minutes, right? And a lot of my buyers or sellers probably want to do the same thing. What do you want, to, what do you want your workday to look like? How many hours do you want to work and what results do you want to get out of it? How much money do you see yourself? And I'm going to change this. Instead of how much money do you see yourself making in the five to 10 years, I want to say, how do you see your life experience in the next five to 10 years? Where are the places you will go, the people you will meet and the experiences you will have? Because the money again is a byproduct. It will fit in a place to afford you those opportunities. It doesn't make sense to be a gazillionaire if you're not experiencing the life that you wanna have. Because the one thing that's for sure folks is we're all gonna die. So you might as well live your best life. Do what you uh, 
do you want to manage a team of agents? Um, how big do you want the team to be? Or do you want to be solo? Do you want to be a one-on-one -on -one type agent where you get to deal with one client at a time? And there's nothing wrong with either. But I will caution you if you think that the only way for you to scale and grow is to create a team, but you're not a manager, you're not a, uh, someone who can influence and that's willing to pour into other people's success, then that's the wrong direction to go in. You might want to think a, a different way about it or the type of team um, that you're going to, to start. And folks, I'm speeding up because I value your time, but I do want every, I want you to see the slides. So if you have questions, feel free to jump in. Um, develop social media. And again, this is a different class. We can get into this thing. In fact, this is a workshop about developing social media. But take this note down. Here is what I believe are the most important platforms today for a real estate agent. Number one, and this one's going to surprise you, TikTok. Yep, you heard it. The guy that said, ain't nobody buying no houses on TikTok. It's so important now, and here's why. You still have the opportunity to create influence and to be a top creator, and that, that's gonna go away. Just like, think about what Facebook is today and think about what it was 10 years ago. So now's the time for you to go up there. So number one, TikTok. Number two in my mind is Instagram. And then from there is whatever you want it to be. I mean, I won't even go in depth from there. Like if you're a, twi uh, a Twitter, <laughs> if you are a tweeter, you can do Twitter, right? If you are, you know, Facebook, go Facebook. If you're LinkedIn, go LinkedIn. If, but for me, the third would be YouTube because I'm trying to, when it comes to video, I'm trying to learn how to go from short form to long form and to create evergreen product, which means when I say that, I want to create videos that resonate with people three years from now and it's easy to find. And I feel like it's more apt to get lost on social media or social media platforms tend to change so frequently that it may get lost. But one thing that has been constant is YouTube. Video is there. I don't foresee a, uh, anyone big taking over the, 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 the brand loyalty of a YouTube. It's just too easy and they're plastered. When people Google a key term, guess what comes up? You know the top websites and some videos. Where are the videos hosted? On YouTube. So those are my thoughts. I would say focus on the top two or three and then start to get things going. Start with the number one. So if you're not quite getting TikTok, you know, focus on Instagram now, that's okay. But start to get used to TikTok. Start to, and when you, when you, if you haven't downloaded TikTok and you're not on TikTok, do it because then you'll realize why it's so addictive a lot more addictive than even Instagram is. Um, and it's because of the short form video, all right? Everyone's a creator up there. All right. Um, yes, use high quality marketing materials along with your real everyday life marketing materials. So your website, you want everything to be branded and you want that brand to be nice and you want it to be consistent. So um, me and the blue jacket, right? That that is by design. There's people that call our team wanting to buy or sell our house and they want to talk to the guy in the blue jacket with the nice smile. My name is typically not, it's not even on our Google profile. It just says Bold Realty and it's got my photo. But I try to be consistent. Um, so wherever I see a, our brand anywhere else online, if the photo is not that photo, sometimes I'll try to marry that up because what I want to do is I want people to see that image on Google. I want them to see us on uh, and on our marketing material, our print material when we farm with postcards. I want them to see me when we retarget on social media. And so he's, eventually what happens is that person goes, oh, my God, I see you everywhere. And granted, I tried to do the logo as the as the brand. People can't resonate. They, they can't root behind a logo alone, especially when you're a small business. But they can they can get behind a personality, a face. And this is the same reason why you have to be careful if you are, you know, looking at team, that kind of concept. You don't want to dilute and have 30 different people being your brand because it will, nothing will ever, ever stick. So decide a central thing, focus on that, and then build, build your network of partners, your team members from that, because that creates the win-win situation. Um, Creating a blog, I'm, I don't like writing, 
but I'm going to give you a tech tip. If you do want to create a blog and you want to, you don't have the time for it, but you want good blogs, consider Jarvis. That's J-A-R-B-I-S. Jarvis.ai. Jarvis is a copyright platform. So if you want to write a great um, marketing description on a listing, you can go in Jarvis and write, you could type in keywords, hardwood floors, granite countertops, 3,000 square feet, in-ground pool, uh, executive style home. You could do that and it'll write you this beautiful description implementing all those features where you don't have to figure out, okay, how do I write this and make it sound good? But at the same time, you can it can create blogs for you based off of um, your, you know, what type of information you want to put out there. I would recommend doing vlogs versus blogs. So do vid videos and then marrying up your blog to that because that's going to get SEO traffic and people are going to be better able to find it and more interested in seeing it because they don't just have to read. They can actually watch uh, the video to go with it. So our summary, and I'm sorry we went over a little bit in time, uh, on time, but to wrap things up, be sure that you're authentic. Be your true self. Be your real self. Be unapologetic about it. Um, and it'll resonate. You'll start to, to gain um, a following from that. Remember that you are the product. So when it comes to branding and marketing, show people what's on stage, but show them what's behind the curtain. Um, ensure that your marketing establishes you as the agent of choice, not just an agent, an option, but the option. What makes you stand out as far as that? Bring those things together, stay consistent with it, do it on a regular basis, and you will be amazingly surprised at the results that you'll get just by, you know, being consistent with your branding message and your marketing objectives. So um, that's going to conclude um, our session for today. Um, I'm, I'm going to be here for a second to answer any questions you have. Um, but I appreciate you guys for hanging in there with me that long. Hope you guys got something out of this. And I hope you, if, and here's what I want you to take away from this. Implement one to two things that you learn. If you, if you haven't learned anything, improve on something that you already knew, but one to two things and put a bullseye on your forehead until you do it. So create a pain point until I do this. For example, I'm going to pick on, um, I don't think she's here. Anyway, but if Emily, if you're still here, Emily loves coffee, all right? So Emily, you can't buy coffee. You can't go get your favorite cup of coffee until you implement those one or two things. That's gonna inspire you to get them done. So figure out what that is, implement it. And I'm really curious. Oh, you're, you are still here, Emily. Okay, so uh, I'm curious to find out uh, what results you guys get out of this over the long term. So please keep me informed and thank you for your time. Um, what questions, comments do you have? Oh, good. That means I did an excellent job. I'll go with that. <laughs> How did you make your PowerPoint? Oh, Canva. So it, I it looks can, really nice. That, well, yeah, thank you. Um, our marketing manager, Miss Alexis, actually made it for us. Um, but Canva, C-A-N-V-A, they have a free option. Um, you can go in there. You're limited with how many presentations you can do with the free one, but it's plenty for you to, and you can do everything with it. You can create social media stuff, uh, PowerPoints, um, everything. You can actually, what we're talking about before, branding, you can create a brand off of it. Um, and then if you love it, then you can just, you can subscribe and, and get a, a more robust platform. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Andrew, real, real quick, yeah. I remember a couple months ago, you gave me advice on um, on how much content to post like in a single post. I think you said like the rule of eight or something like that. Like yeah. only so many pictures, words before people's brains start going crazy because there's way too much information on a, a single post. Yeah, Can you touch absolutely. On that? Yeah, so yeah, so you see, um, and again, Alexis, I'm not gonna pick on her at all, but Alexis created this without any of my input. I was just like, make it pretty and, and make sure my notes are up there. So when you look at this image and you know, big companies know about this, imagine this is a billboard. First of all, 
What's something that stands out to you? The font is a little bit difficult to read. It's pretty, but it's a little bit difficult to read. So you wanna be very strategic in the things that you implement in any of your marketing. And every element counts as a thing. So if you have five colors, just imagine you've already taken up five of the eight elements that you wanna implement in your marketing. Limit your colors, limit your font and make it easier to read. Um, create a CTA, a call to action. What do you want the viewer, the audience to do when they see that ad? And so what I, what's been recommended and what's in the marketing industry is that you, you limit those things from, um, to not go over seven to eight elements. So even your picture in it is an element. Um, I see billboards and I'm like, I don't know if they want me to, I don't know if that's a dentist or a teacher or I don't know what that is. Do they want me to vote for them for office? Because it's just so busy. And, you know, I'm picking on billboards because you get a few seconds to look at that. But just imagine as you're scrolling through your social media, you got a limited amount of time to get your point across. Does that, does that answer your question, Willis? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think it's only like, what, six to seven seconds or so that they're going to be able to read or see your, your ad. And if you throw a book at them, they're not going to, you're going to freak them out and they're not going to want to see it, you know? Yeah. Well, depending on what vault, what what platform you're marketing on, it's even less than six to seven seconds. It could be like three seconds if you're lucky. So what's the number one thing? Because they're going to start one place and then they're going to go down if they're, you know, to to see more. Um, so just think about as a viewer, when you guys start looking, I want you to start looking at ads and seeing which ones stand out to you and which ones resonate more than others. You'll notice the busy ones kind of hurt your brain and you try to get away from it as soon as possible. Anything else, folks? All right, well, look, happy selling. I'm gonna get on another call. I appreciate you guys and I will see you soon. Bye everyone. See ya.